All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin. So if you would take your seats. Let me start off by asking uh, our, our, my expert colleagues up here at the front of the room, George and, and Jim and Johnny, based on what you heard in the first session, what are your guidelines for this scenario? What are you, you know, any, any kind of cautionary comments or things that you hope will address? Well, if I could start, I mean, one of the things I, I think we clearly uh, came out of the, the comments in the first round here is that we need to move from the general to the particular, to the specific. We need to disaggregate somehow um, these broad generalizations about the north, the south, and et cetera. Uh, it's clear from the, from, from the comments that, that some of you believe that there are important groups in this space with whom one can and should work, who deserve and need our support precisely in, in countering the uh, forces, the drivers of extremism. And so it, I think as part of this next round, uh, and part of the scenario, that one of the things you need to be thinking about, who are those groups and how do we engage them? And so that we get out of our typical relationship sets, government to government, et cetera, and think about how we develop those kinds of relationships. Great. Jim? Uh, thanks, David, again, uh, for inviting me and everybody else today. I'm still trying to absorb some of the great comments I heard around the table that uh, uh, reflect my experience in a lot of other places with not uh, with dissimilar ba backgrounds but similar problems. Uh, one being, hey, uh, over the time that Boko Haram uh, has grown up and become a real threat, uh, the Nigerian GDP, what was it, has more than doubled? Tripled. Uh, comment on uh, the importance of security, and boy, I can underline that from my experiences in the Balkans and uh, Iraq, that uh, you can't have any development without that. Uh, and again, going from uh, both you, David, and you, George, going from the specific, uh, from the general to the specific, uh, in particular, uh, you can't deal with a short-term security problem with a long-term economic social transformation, I don't think, uh, for many reasons. But what you can do is figure out what are the groups out there, and typically there are four, the uh, uh, people who should be supporting the government, the people who are on the uh, fence, the people who are caught up in any insurgency like Boko Haram but may or may not be totally committed and the hardcore committed, each of them require different sets of social, economic, uh, and political approaches. And you can't do that from afar. There's ways to do that down to, you know, buying off this group, giving this group more bullets, uh, using force against a third group, or threatening it. There are all kinds of ways, conventional and unconventional, that people have done this, at least short term, on the ground. But the emphasis is on the ground. Great. Uh, Johnny? Thanks uh, very much. Let me uh, add uh, to the other comments by saying it really is important to focus on the concrete and existential things uh, that can be done uh, in the immediate future. Uh, focus on the, uh, on the, on the current uh, uh, issues. Uh, I would also say look for ways to empower reformers who are trying to uh, promote uh, good uh, governance uh, and trying to uh, really uh, empower uh, economic change and reform. Uh, second, call out uh, the spoilers. Uh, call out uh, those who uh, are undermining uh, the progress uh, that uh, is, uh, is impeding uh, the, uh, the process of isolating uh, Boko Haram or creating uh, the uh, opportunities for them to uh, continue to, uh, to, to move, uh, move forward. Perfect. Thank you very much. I think that's good advice. I hope you internalize that advice as we go forward in the, in the context of this discussion. There's a lot of moving parts to this scenario. Basically, we're going to ask the questions. Then I'm gonna, we're going to show a few slides that frame it. Then we're going to get into the first move. Then I'm going to ask everybody around the table to think about who they might collaborate with and talk to them in a 10-minute in break. Then we'll come back and we'll talk about 
what we have concluded we might be able to do. We'll go to the second move, do the same thing, the third move, do the same thing, and then we'll try to draw some conclusions from all of that. Uh, periodically, I will ask some of you questions about what your groups might do, and you may when we'll raise your hand and say, what about us? We have, we have a perspective on this. Uh, but we'll have to try to keep it very crisp because there's just a lot to go over in the context of this thing. Let's start with the three questions um, that we have posed, one of which is going to look familiar. What's the single biggest economic contributor to extremism in northern Nigeria? Um, the deindustrialization of northern Nigeria, increasing poverty, youth unemployment, unequal distribution of natural resources, or other. We don't have to relitigate the first time we sort of did this question. Are there five questions? Five questions. And so youth unemployment is, is the vast majority of you said that that was the issue. That's clearly going to be central to the scenario. Who said other? You said other. Why'd you say other? Okay, youth empowerment. Okay, but fine. I, I'll repeat it if, it if it's up close here. Okay, next. Agree or disagree, Nigeria will be unable to counter Boko Haram without the economic revitalization of northern Nigeria. This is a range question. Strongly disagree, disagree, neither agree or disagree, agree or strongly agree. So where are you on this question? Uh, well, that was really noncommittal of you. <laughs> doesn't, 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 you're clearly all over the place. Perhaps this bodes well for, for a lively discussion. Next. Which group has the biggest interest in the economic revitalization of northern Nigeria? The international community, the Nigerian government, northern Nigerian elites, southern Nigerian business interests, international business interests, neighboring countries, or other? All of the above, Jeez. None of the above, all of the above. Northern Nigerian elites. Well, that's actually probably accurate, so let's move on to the next question. And nobody said other, which shows that you're... What? You, you said other? Is there something going on back here? Are we censoring people? We've, I'm sorry, your, your buttons have all been disconnected. <laughs> Actually, it's appropriate because we were saying you, it's the disenfranchised population that Which has you the are. biggest economic right. interest. Right. <laughs> all right. Next, what group can, can best deliver economic assistance to northern Nigeria? International NGOs, the World Bank and the IMF, the United Nations, the Nigerian government, bilateral donors, or the ever popular other? And the Nigerian government uh, is, is listed as the group that can best do it. Uh, whether they will do it best remains a, a question. Uh, who said other? Princeton. Uh, I think private sector investment is very important here. Private sector investors. Kim. Yes, a combination of private sector and also just what group can or should. I mean, I, I would agree that it's the Nigerian government, but and I know we're doing a scenario, but the reality is they cannot at the moment. Right, and I think that's the correct, I mean it says can best as opposed to should best, yes. State governments, okay. Next, what economic measures are best suited to confront the spread of extremism in northern Nigeria? Increased job training for the unemployed and unskilled, economic development projects to restart shuttered factories, infrastructure projects to better connect the north and the south, microfinance for businesses in the region, or other? And so microfinance for businesses in the region leads the way by quite a bit. Infrastructure project next. Did one of you say other? Why did you say other, besides craving attention? I. <laughs> I didn't see governance, uh, rule of law, corruption. Um, I think this is more a governance question, really. Okay. Is there one more? Pardon me? That's it. Okay, good. Um, so let's go to the slides that are setting up the scene. 
Um, and this is exploring the economic drivers of radicalization and extremism. You may not be able to see them extremely well. I will highlight them for you by an interpretive dance. Let's go to the first slide, please. Okay, the Nigerian economy, as many of you have commented on, has experienced exponential growth. Over the past decade, it has seen impressive macro macroeconomic growth driven by the resource-rich South, but the benefits have not been felt broadly, and I think that's the critical point of this. Uh, GDP, uh, that chart on the right is a GDP growth chart, which is remarkable. Um, uh, now, uh, in 2013, over $500 billion. Uh, the economy is increasingly diversified, although oil represents the biggest part of it. Development is largely focused in the South. Uh, Nigeria is ranked as the 33rd most corrupt country in the world out of a cup 200. Uh, it suggests that more than $400 billion has been lost to corruption since 1960, and wealth is largely concentrated in the hands of the few. Next slide. Um, despite growth, there is still rampant poverty, and you can look at the uh, differences between the North and the South. In the North, the blue region, unemployment is 34 uh, percent. The relative poverty rate is 74 percent. In the South, um, while the relative poverty rate is also very high at 67 percent, unemployment is substantially lower at 19 percent. Uh, unemployment has been rising even though GDP has been rising. Um, poverty rates have increased over this period. Rural and youth populations are particularly at risk. 38% um, uh, of Nigerians between 15 and 24% are without worth, work, and 73% of the population in rural areas is in poverty compared to 61%. Northern Nigeria is the hardest hit. Some states have unemployment rates topping 40%. And it's estimated that more than 50% of the youth in the North are unemployed as well. Next. Um, and Boko Haram's rise is linked to the Northern economic plight. It rose in the disadvantaged North. Uh, uh, easy targets for radicalization for the reasons we've discussed. The growing instability as a result of Boko Haram attacks has wreaked further havoc on the economy, worsening unemployment and poverty and creating even more fertile breeding ground. And um, Nigeria clearly is in need of economic ex assistance for all of these um, reasons. Let's go to the next slide. So this, we are about to get into the scenario moves, um, and we will describe the first move, uh, and then we'll give you a bit of a chance to discuss it. Let's go to the first move. Um, by the way, we do have this just for those of you who are watching at home. Um, the following moves and information within are fictional. They're solely for purposes of the peace game and not to be interpreted as real life occurrences. They don't represent a political view on our part. We are not recommending these ha things happen or predicting that these things will happen. These are just fictional for the purposes of the game. Okay, so the first move um, focuses on, this discussion will focus on Boko Haram's influence growing in Kano uh, and the government there, worried about the influence of Boko Haram, calls for economic development. They are making a call saying, we need help on this front. Uh, and there's a, 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 a fictional Reuters uh, story here saying, the extremist group Boko Haram has been gaining support and influence in ma major northern Nigeria city of Kano. Local reports <laughs> suggest a number of prominent businessmen in the city have voiced support for the group. Those of you playing local business, you'll need to explain that, uh, citing its anti-corruption cause and pure interpretation of Islam, and hundreds of citizens have been joining the cause in re recent weeks. Kano's got 2.1 uh, million people, and the goal here is to identify options for economic aid in the North based on just where we're standing with this, where the, where the country is, and that we're looking at the situation here in Kano. Um, and you know, each of you will have to sort of tackle this as a group. You and Boko Haram are going to tell us what you see as the targets of opportunity, why the targets of opportunity there, what looks good to you and why, okay? And then each of the other groups will have to look at this and say, what could we do? Can the European Union write a check? Is there something international NGOs can do? Local Nigerian business interests, some of you are signing on with Boko Haram. Why are you signing on with Boko Haram? 
you're, you look like you're enjoying signing on with Boko Haram. It's extremely <laughs> disturbing. Do you cover it? Do you not cover it? And so forth. And so we'll go around the room and we will explore this. But I want to give you just five minutes. Talk among yourselves in your group. Figure out what your position is in this. If there are any ideas that you've got, if the European Union decides they want to go and do something in the United Nations, feel free to go talk to the United Nations. Um, okay? Don't, don't get up, don't go too far, because we will reconvene in five minutes, okay? Well, we can't really go. You can send me, I'll, I'll, I'll sacrifice myself. So I think we need to do you know, things like uh, the profile of uh, of one of those businessmen. Find one of the businessmen who has a plan. Oh, sorry. Scenario. Was he was he down here? He was down here briefly. He'll be he'll be back. Um, we'll make sure we bring him over to meet you when he's good. There was there was not there another Nigerian coming and then he didn't come? Yes, then he didn't. We actually invited him to the States. So we have a Right, and I'm gonna i I'm gonna start. We'll begin in two minutes.
possibly your always the counter narrative. But what about sort of positive narrative? What is the post narrative? Why do we always have to counter and respond? Right, well, exactly. You, know, you should write about it. I mean, you should use us. I mean, we can, we can work also can give you a different platform. I would also think yeah. you should do that. You should do that. You really good. Right. Now I must All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you take your seats? Would you return to your seats, please? We'd love to see them. You want Boko Haram in Connecticut now? Oh, I see. <laughs> All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's let's explore this. Clearly, this was a scene setter. It was a first move in the context of all of this. And see, as I walk slowly towards you, you're supposed to grow quiet and respectful. Um, OK, so folks, we're ready to begin here. So it's the media. It's the chattering class chattering. Uh, so what I, what I want to do is uh, clearly this is a scene setter. But what we, you know, this is the framing notion, right? The framing notion is you've got a place, you've got Boko Haram growing in that place, and the government says one of the ways we can fight this is with economic development. And the question is, what economic development? How do we do that? But to set it, I thought I'd go to Mohammed, who is actually from northern Nigeria and has experienced these situations, and talk about the reality of, you know, why this is so why urgent steps are needed, why the short-term solutions as well as the long-term solutions are needed. You already set the ball rolling by saying that we should move from generalizations to concrete uh, suggestions on how we should move forward. And uh, as we discussed over uh, the coffee break, uh, for us uh, coming from not only northern Nigeria but northeastern Nigeria, where at the moment, uh, there are almost uh, two dozen local governments uh, in Yobe, Borno, and Adamawa states that are currently under occupation uh, by Boko Haram, uh, administering uh, this uh, local government and spreading. Uh, I think the, the, the issue for us is an uh, issue of survival as, as a people. Uh, 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 a colleague around the table before the break said, okay, uh, uh, without restoring peace uh, in this sub-region, how are we going to proceed with some of these uh, laudable, uh, concrete, uh, uh, short, medium, and long-term uh, suggestions that are being bandied around uh, the, the table? Uh, uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have the answer to that. But what I know is that without uh, some joint efforts uh, between all the stakeholders, uh, the federal, the state governments, the local governments, the communities, as well as our international friends, uh, it would be, as time goes on, uh, with the uh, correction we have seen in the oil price, uh, and uh, already the projections we are seeing for next year, that the situation is going to get worse. Now, military support, Boko Haram, in my opinion, has to be crushed first. And I know military solution alone cannot do that, but military solution uh, is the precursor to all other solutions. Until we get support from our international friends like the United States and other countries to militarily crush them, 
and move ahead with some of these socio-economic uh, suggestions, it would almost be impossible uh, to all right, and, this I, and I think we can circle back to the military one, but let's let's stay within the parameters of this scenario. The Nigerian government has called for economic development. What do you, as the Nigerian government, actually plan to do? Well, look, this shows how proactive we are. We've got this, yeah. and it shows that we recognize the problem. So what we would like to see happen is, you know, we, the reason we took this step is because we realized that, you know, the governor in Kano, you know, hasn't been acting on this. We have a number of state governments that we have had trouble with in terms of being practiced. So the federal government thinks that this is the way to go. What we'd like to see are a couple things. One, we'd like to see for this economic plan to work, we need military assistance. We really need to see, we need to have, is, is to crush the insurgency, but we need to be able to create an environment where businesses can be fostered, where we can attract investment. Two, we need multinational companies. We want to try to get foreign investment because there's a huge consumer base in northern Nigeria. You know, uh, Procter Gamble just opened up a $300 million factory, uh, and we, what we want to do is build upon that in the northern area. So we think that that's a key piece of it. And third is that we need the international community. More than the multinationals, we need the sort of European Union, we need the sort of the World Bank. We need them to follow through on their promises because there's been a lot of rhetoric about helping us, but we haven't seen a lot of it. Okay, you seem to have misunderstood my question, which was what is the Nigerian government going to do? You just listed three things you would like other people to do. There's, what we're doing is, is clear. It's, yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so long as we've established that, <laughs> because I think it is, I think, I think it is clear. Um, so this is your government. <laughs> this is your government in Abuja. And the action they're taking is calling for somebody else to take action. The northern Nigerian governments, what, what can you do? I think this question was tossed to Paul Lubeck and myself and maybe a few others who have lived in Kano for many, many, many years. Uh, the governor of Kano is running for the president. It will know by next Wednesday he's one of the top three. It's a seat of opposition, so we don't expect anything other than mischief from Abuja. What we do think is that, as the Sultan says many times, no, no peace, no, no development. We can do state police and state security, and the governor there is very tough, uh, and the new emir is very tough, and they will, if given the license, create the security, there's enough money and wealth in, in Kano itself to bring some of that investment back home. We don't need the outside investors. So, so, so we, you're going to deploy the, the state governor police. and The governor will, will create, has created his own Conquasia uh, militia. The, the, con, the confab last summer, the big national conference, did allow for states uh, to set up, to experiment with state police. Okay, Until but, but you get state police and local intelligence, you're going to have this grassroots okay, So in this around. context, in the context of the scenario we're talking about, not what's happening, but in the scenario, yeah. are, you're deploying the state police? We will create and deploy very sor shortly, if we can keep these Abuja people off our back. Okay, Kano how, is how the seat of opposition. Okay, how many the, people is the, what you will deploy? Well, ballpark. Kano State is 12 million. You're yeah, no, no, but how many two... people will you deploy state police? Just a ballpark number. <laughs> as many as necessary. This, okay, is, a large, is, this is the largest okay, state. Not, you you got to give me a number. Paul, give, give him a number. He, he, your local Nigerian business interests. For all I know, you're in Boko Haram. <laughs> we, we, that, that's because you don't understand our culture. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> the uh, governor... Uh, just, just, I just has the capacity to create uh, neighborhood uh, associations that one of the preconditions here that were very popular among northern Muslims in Kano was the Hizbah. They had some problems with them, but they wanted government, they wanted local government control. That can be cleaned up and, as a basis for neighborhood uh, community policing okay, as well as state couple, police. To, we're talking about a couple of thousand no, people. No, we're, the number of, of militia right now on the ground, the Conquasi, is 7,000. Right. 
Yeah. Uh, that would need to be expanded considerably for a state of 12 million to get really federal, state, and, and local police. is that possible? Police. Is that something you could do? It's, it, it is a constitutional issue. It was, that's why I mentioned the conference right. last summer. Uh, Inshallah. It, it, it would be, I think it's something that could be interpreted, and, and, and okay. we will end up with police. I see real level. indecision on the part of the local government. The national government is out to lunch. They're, they're, no, they're, they're calling for, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, we got to call it like we see it here. How do you view this? So far, you've got this response. How, how do you view it? As a target of opportunity? Why? Uh, we're on a roll. <laughs> and we're going to maximize that. What are we going to do? Uh, first of all, a full-blown assault on the traditional political and religious leadership in Kano. Secondly, so, sorry guys, that's you. <laughs> We're ready. Secondly, With our 7, in those parts of the city which we control, we're going to set up neighborhood Sharia courts and we are going to provide a higher level of justice and much, uh, much faster justice than the current system allows for. Third, we are going to set out to destroy all of the judicial institutions that remain in Kano, blowing up courthouses, police stations, and so forth. And finally, we will step up our recruitment of Boko Haram operatives by increasing slightly the signing bonuses that we provide. Did I leave anything? You guys are, you've got, clearly got your act together, more so than, <laughs> More, more so than some other folks. You're the local business interest. Now, you've heard sort of different platforms here of different groups coming into your community. Where do you guys come out and why? The, and and by, from the, point by of, the way, in the context of the scenario, I want you to be responsive to what you've just heard. Right, right. There, I'll try to c capture all of them. There needs to be the reestablishment of security using a local governance system. You could revive the district head, ward head system under the brilliant Emir Sanusi, along with a parallel organization under the governor, so that knowledge of what's going on in each ward will allow the government and the traditional authorities to cooperate to understand who is there. These cells that are represented to my right can be overcome by proper governance and community okay, control. Okay, but, but you're the Nigerian business interests. Right. What are you going to do? Right, the Nigerian business interests, from the point of view of Nigerian businessmen and women, the key function that's needed is the coordination function between the state and associations of business people. There needs to be funding for much better manufacturers association at different levels. There needs to be linkages with agricultural producers to produce raw material, process food, meat. They need to build on the existing leather industry, which produces $700 million of uh, pr fine le leather, mostly goats and sheep. Because it's goats, a basis, this can be, linkage, backward linkages can be created with women and small-scale producers to raise incomes. Okay, so that's prescriptive. But what are you going to do? You're the Nigerian business interest. Are you affiliating yourself with Boko Haram? Are you working with the government? What are you doing in this scenario? In this scenario, we will be working primarily with the government in uh, creating associations uh, that will uh, support the uh, increase in capital uh, credit available for capital so that some of the uh, estates, industrial estates that existed at one time and they were state run in Kano can then be revitalized. That's one. The other is that we as business associations are going to appeal to local producers for raw materials. And many of those are women, but they're also young men, and it can provide a large amount of employment for youth in the area. We can uh, set up cluster farming systems for smallholders with central uh, food processing or leather processing plants 
in the communities. And uh, with some credit, we can improve the inputs of fertilizer and seeds. And we will also work with the um, LGA government to try to encourage them to invest in better roads for farms to market and also look at the possibility of setting up power plants. Okay, this is right. Power plants take seven years. What's your, I, quick, quick. In, in other words, that's, you're, you're all talking very long term. Mm -hmm. We've got a crisis unfolding as it happens. Just a quick uh, two finger from Boko Haram to explain what we're offering you. We're gonna offer the local business community our, our jihad tax is gonna be a flat rate. You can work into your business model. It'll be lower than the exactions you're paying. Our local Sharia courts will deal with the local usurers. Petty theft from your businesses will stop, and you get reliable settlement of contract disputes, all for the uh, payment of the nominal, very small, and much lower jihad tax. Doesn't that sound better? <laughs> These guys aren't doing anything. And, uh, why, why wouldn't you be resp Yes, go on, I was man. just going to say, make no mistake about it, we already have some business leaders with us. So we'll, we'll continue to peel off as many as we can. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you guys are covering this, right? How'd you cover the Nigerian government's plea for help? Did you cover it at all? Did that appear in any media anywhere? Yeah, uh, A16. Page 16. A16. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, the, uh, okay, it was buried. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then I think we, we want our reporter to do two things. One is to talk to the businesses that are cooperating with Boko Haram about why they're doing it and whether they feel any um, moral, uh, they have any scruples about doing it after all. They know that some of these Boko Haram commanders um, have Christian girls who are enslaved as their consorts right now. And then as to those who, uh, business leaders who are not cooperating with Boko Haram, I think we want our reporters to uh, interview the survivors. Sur the sur yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, but I want to, let me no ask one question before yeah. we get to that. So, that's the back of the book. They then conduct an attack where does that get covered? That's A1. That's the front of the, you know, that's, that, that actually makes news. I just want to bring this up because then I turn to the multinational corporations that they just called for. How do you feel about investing in northern Nigeria in this circumstance? <laughs> we don't care about northern Nigeria. Uh, we're, uh, we're in the south, the oil is in the south, but we do care about the overall stability of the Nigerian state so we can do business. So we are interested in, as part of our corporate social responsibility, in getting the government to pony up some money, and we would pony up some money that would work with a private NGO or something to do something with Northerners. So we are interested in doing something in the North, not because we really care about it, but because we want to be able to do our work. It's so, so it's a pittance? It's well, a gesture? It's, it's like what we're doing in the south in the Niger Delta, which is, you know, working with communities and developing leaders and stuff like that. So it's not a pittance. It's millions of dollars. Um, and because it wouldn't be run by the government, it wouldn't be corrupt like everything that the government does. And would it be working with local companies? Local, would it be? local NGOs. With, with, with local NGOs. Where are the local NGOs? <laughs> So, so what do you do with the money that they're giving you? We have a plan to create a, a coalition of local NGOs, international NGOs, local businesses who will support us in media. And it consists of three parts. One, together with the governor of Kano and, and the emir of Kano, uh, we will create a dialogue of these communities to get people to be able to express their grievances too. We will uh, enact legislation that will set up <laughs> courts that will challenge Boko Haram's anti-corruption narrative. And these will be courts that will be empowered at the state level to deal with corruption prosecution in a quick way and to get some resolution of these. And we'll work with their local security forces to protect these courts from being attacked. And the third element is, is an advocacy campaign to get people to realize that there is an alternative, a rule of law alternative to fighting corruption. This sounds pretty good as far as I'm concerned. I think they're playing right into your hands, right? <laughs> I mean, they are going to set up courts which effectively will end up prosecuting some of them and some of them, right? I mean, that'll sort of sell your message, right? Or am I missing something? Go ahead. The difference is 
our courts are going to be set up tomorrow. They're locally based. It is Boko Haram supporters who have considerable clout in their local neighborhoods who will be running these courts. And finally, I would say, we're on a roll. Do you want to be on the winning side or not? <laughs> the, Nigerian, the Nigerian government would like to speak. Um, who would you like to ask for help now? <laughs> First, I'd like to say that you're on a roll if you consider slaughtering thousands of innocent civilians to be on a roll or winning, and we certainly don't. We welcome the uh, investment and the training from the multinational corporations. We look forward to loans from the international financial community. But most of all, we do need to provide security. We need to take care of these terrorists. And we need the European Union and the United States to sell us lethal weapons so we can do the job that we need to do. And we need the United States to relax these Leahy laws that restrict them from providing us what we need. All right, well, let's explore both of those things. These international loans they speak of. This country is in, you know, it's had a lot of money, first of all, but it now seeing its growth prospects curtailed over the course of the next couple of months. Are, are they going to get a lot of loans? Do you, do you expect to see, you know, cash from the bank and the fund and the African Development Bank pouring in there, or am I missing something? Just have a quick shot of that. I mean, I, I think from our side, we were proposing a threefold approach. First of all, was the IMF, which tends to deal primarily with the central government, looking at the issue of allocation of resources from the center to the particular province, whether it's something that could be done to, to increase that or not. Secondly, from the point of view of the World Bank, African Development Bank, and other international do donors, having a twofold approach, approach. One is looking at what are the policy changes that need to be put in place to try and make reforms in, in Kano. This is not something that takes very long. It's sitting down with the governor, sitting down with the emir. What do you need to do about the state-owned enterprises? Are there issues of uh, liberalization of markets? What are the kind of policy changes you need to make? And you could support that with an international conference where donors, World Bank and others, put in quick dispersing money, gets money in, into the state budget quickly. In a sense, buying, if, if you to use a rather crude term, reforms that would make a difference and reforms which the government itself wants to, to make. And the third side of that would be putting in, in, uh, in place programs to support education, health, and in particular community development, coming back to the role of women, uh, as has been done in, in many countries very successfully, setting up community development uh, committees, for example, was done very successfully in, in Afghanistan. It gets participation from the local community. Um, there are also longer-term measures that need to be addressed. The energy crisis was one which was r raised with us. So I think we could come up with a pretty concrete, specific program addressing both short-run and longer-term needs. Didn't sound like loans to me, though. I just want, you know, want to un understand that. They, they made a request that we, the yeah, U.S. government, I, I, change its I'd policy. I'd first like to say the United States would like just state a platform to start with. The Cold War has ended. We know the world is a more dangerous place. Um, we know we have a role to play in northern Nigeria, uh, but that role is limited because our influence with the Nigerian government is limited. Uh, to test that, just even being able to train their troops is something they no longer want us to do. So uh, their request for uh, military aid uh, is not going to happen until we have a better relationship with with the Nigerian government. Uh, we do know that there's a role we can play now. We can attempt to stop the funding of Boko Haram uh, from the Middle East and other areas. The arrogance of Boko Haram is, is telling for two reasons. No American business is going to be able to develop in your, in your area. It can't happen. No European business is going to be able to be there. It can't happen. You will have no development, so you will be bankrupt for the future. And you're so against education, that is the uh, ingredient that will make us want to be there. 
Okay. Did you want to say something quickly? I'm going to ask everybody to keep it very quick right now. Yeah. Um, we, um, from the um, multilateral organizations, recognize the willingness of local Nigerian business organizations to be part of this. Um, but for the um, larger Dangotes of this world, we'll consider um, using the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency to try to mitigate some of the risks of um, revitalizing the textile and oil palm and you know, industries in, in, in the north to make it easy for um, investment. Okay. To David, so, the local media has an interjection uh, <laughs> when we wait for no man. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll uh, see if we, we turn off the TV, but we, go on. <laughs> we, we are in support of the uh, Nigerian civil society and uh, are launching a corrupt anti-corruption monitor. We have an anonymous benefactor in the room who is funding us to launch a major uh, anti-corruption monitor called Bring Back Our Money. Uh, <laughs> and we actually are exposing the corruption on some of these anticipated deals in the Nigerian government that of course wants more money to come in that is going to go into their pockets. And because there is a long-term problem here and you know we need to better understand the drivers that uh, propel young people to join Boko Haram. We're doing uh, two things in the international media. We're doing a long expose on, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the role of local Nigerian businesses, uh, as uh, Cliff was, was saying, how they're um, perhaps benefiting from uh, aligning themselves with Boko Haram, but we're also giving some of these young people who are joining Boko Haram uh, video cameras to film a diary to explain to an international audience why they've joined, what it means to them, and then we will curate what they've pulled together to try to get a better understanding. Okay. From an international NGO perspective, we're concerned that instead of, fo uh, instead of the government focusing on the underlying problems, which are corruption, uh, they're instead focusing on more lethal weapons uh, and, and aiding and abetting those units that potentially would perpetrate human rights violations. That doesn't bring the population on your side, that just undercuts your le legitimacy, and we think the name of the game here is reinforcing your legitimacy. Um, we also have significant concerns on the humanitarian assistance side. Yeah, we'd like to point out but that can, there's Can I just ask a question as to the scenario, and I'm, I'm obviously playing along here, but wh who cares? Why do we care whether you're concerned? I mean, what, 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 what bearing does that have on the way this plays out? In other words, are you not going to give some money that you were going to give? Are you going to give some money in a different place? I mean, either you're playing or you're commenting. And so the question is, are you just making a comment, which is fine, or is it going to have an effect? We, we can't support, if the government doesn't ask or enable certain things to happen, like the anti-corruption right. courts we mentioned, and put in place that structure, there's nothing for us to support. In order, in order for us to pair with the Nigerian NGOs and civil society and actually counteract what's there, we need the government to at least tacitly agree to that. Okay. So, so, so we're going to lobby our donor governments to not to respond to the Nigerian government request for more lethal assistance because of human rights okay, abuses, and we're going to press for humanitarian response, uh, which is more important and imperative in the short run than economic assistance programs. No, we have that to deal very with the food insecurity and the cholera outbreaks. Right. It sounds to me like NGOs are going to make it harder for other governments to respond. Princeton, quickly, then Peter. Uh, look, this is an important scenario because it's Kano. Kano is a major center. It's got a history of progressivism. So what happens in Kano has an effect on the whole North and North-South relations. We can't get caught up in the As fight. As they say in Nigeria, what happens in Kano doesn't stay in Kano. Yeah, that's right. right. And, and the second thing to keep in, two things. We can't get caught up from the European Union, and I would think others, in this political battle between the government and, and the opposition governor of Kano. That's, that's an, uh, a thing we can't get caught up in. The third thing is that the business community, we have to remember in Kano is a Nigerian and a Lebanese community. We have to make sure that Boko Haram isn't trying to reach in and create religious and other divisions within the very important business community. What you can do in this circumstance from the European Union and World Bank and others is to come in with short-term funding for the business community, short-term loans. The deindustrialization de process has hit Kano very badly. You can't overcome that in the short term, but I think part of it has to be assuring that power plants and other things will be coming to Kano. 
Okay, uh, we're, and we're going to come back to that in the next scenario, which is going to begin in a minute. What is? Uh, in, the, in the meantime, uh, we've reached out to the media, invited a member of the media to come and witness one of our commercial dispute settlements in our Sharia courts, as well as the member of the media and perhaps an international NGO to visit a mass grave we've discovered on the edge of Kano from victims of the uh, civilian joint task force. Okay, yeah, very quickly. Just, very, just a question for, for our friends in Boko Haram. If I, as an editor, were to send uh, ace reporters Matt and Kim uh, into your area, will you cooperate with them or will you kill them? Uh, we'd be very happy to show them uh, our courts and the mass grave we dug up. <laughs> okay, that was a pretty ambiguous answer. Yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our countries are really deeply affected by this threat, and we'd like a seat at the table. You, you have a seat at the table. Let me Primarily. ask Primarily. <laughs> we, we want to point out that containment should be the major goal of the international community. We are somewhat of mixed opinion on this subject, but we're not entirely confident that a military solution is possible. We think that we need arms to defend our borders. We need development projects to prevent recruitment from within our citizenry. And we want to emphasize our willingness to continue our dialogue with Boko Haram in the interests of promoting a peaceful solution. But that, first of all, I'm sure they appreciate it. Secondly, um, I, I was going to actually turn to you guys as the last voice in this because I wanted to say, as you listen to all of this, this is on your doorstep. And based on what you've just heard, do you feel more secure or less secure? Is this a growing problem for you? Or do you think they've got their arms around it? I think we, we feel less secure um, because I'm Nigeria glad you were paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Nigeria is the big kid on the block, and if Nigeria goes down with its population of 170 million, the rest of our countries are going to go down as well. Kano is a historic city, and uh, many of the Muslim populations in our respective countries do have a historical attachment to Kano. And uh, while the issue was being dealt with in three other states, uh, Borno, Yobe, and um, Adamawa, it wasn't as dire as is now the case with the extension into Kano. So we're very worried about refugees coming across the border. We're also worried about internally displaced populations within our respective countries. And we're worried about the fact that uh, even if this crisis is resolved, the ripple effects on the economies of our own countries will be felt for the medium to long term. Okay. And, and if I could just add, we're, we're very um, <clears throat> concerned and uh, view with a great deal of consternation the events of the last few years, and so we have lost confidence in Nigeria's ability to come to a resolution, and therefore we are now contemplating that perhaps we should have direct talks with Boko Haram that do not include the government of Nigeria. Okay, interesting, and we'll have to pick that up in the next one. Mohammed, um, this, this really is the last word. So. Okay, so the, the United Nations um, won't do anything without our member states coming to us and asking us to do anything. Uh, but we are going to I thought to you could have just finished with the United Nations won't do anything, but go on. Well, no, no. <laughs> what, what we will do is we're going to report on um, the atrocities that we expect Boko Haram to undertake now. We're going to uh, report on the numbers of displaced people and, uh, and, and, and perhaps uh, uh, the courts that we expect uh, they'll, be, um, uh, they'll be setting up. Uh, and hope that our member states will, either through the Security Council or through uh, other, other uh, cooperation with this information, do something about the situation. We'll also, obviously we have a, a number of our agencies that have programs uh, in, in Nigeria, uh, whether it's on their long-term programs, women's empowerment or um, uh, family planning or uh, combating corruption, uh, we're going to market those. We're going to uh, use the uh, call for economic development to um, uh, get funding from different countries and from different member states to uh, support those programs. Okay. Helpful. George, last word in this moment. Yeah, I, I just no. Uh, the question on the table was we've got um, an appeal for economic uh, assistance, urgent economic assistance in Kano to help bolster economic improvement there. And as I listen to the conversation, I have yet to hear anybody come up with 
specific concrete reactions, responses to that question, how, what, if anything, can be done on an economic plane that would be responsive, A, to the request that's been made, but also Thank you. that would address, address, the, uh, address the issues of uh, uh, countering Boko Haram. Who said thank you? The Nigerian government. Oh, the Nigerian, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Nice no, thank you. Um, uh, we, I, I think it's an important point, and I think that it's something that we should, very briefly, well, I think, Ambassador, I think your point is valid, and, but, but in, on direct talks with the Nigerian government, we found that the request was, was hollow, and their real request, again, was for security and lethal force. And so, uh, you know, where do you go? You're back where you no, started. No, and I, look, I, I, George's point is extremely important in the context of the scenario as we move forward. We need to look for these things. I, I think there have been a number of, 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 of offers of differing types which, by the way, have the ring of truth to me, whether it was how the Nigerians responded, how the local government responded, how Boko Haram responded, how the NGOs and local businesses. This kind of feels roughly what would happen, which is to say not much in the way of concrete action on the ground, advances by you, the situation deteriorates. We move to the next slide, which says Boko Haram attacks recently restarted factories as was indicated here, and there's a, a you know Twitter feed, which is how most of us, you know, get our analysis. Um, so, you know, economic development projects targeted in the attack launched by Boko Haram: 77 killed, 160 injured. Um, the two recently restarted textile factories and a livestock processing facility were the main targets. Uh, four UN aid workers were killed in these attacks. Um, and the goal here is to develop a response to the attacks that ensures um, continued delivery of economic assistance. Well, there isn't a lot of economic assistance, but to develop a response. We've now sort of seen the thing ratchet up because the response was not um, uh, hyper-effective in combating what they were doing. It didn't turn them back. So take five minutes, talk among yourselves, and then we will resume with how you play this situation moving forward.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll begin in two minutes. If you would finish up your conversations, we'll begin in two minutes. All right, we'll begin in one minute. If everybody could be making your way back towards your seats, that would be great. There are a lot of people. All right, ladies and gentlemen, would you take your seats and we will begin. All right. So Here's the situation. We are in a state that is extremely important, that has implications not just within Nigeria, but for the region. Uh, we have seen within this state an expansion of the influence and um, uh, violence of Boko Haram. Uh, it clearly takes a difficult situation and it puts it at further risk. And so we want to see what kind of concrete responses along the lines of those that George was referring to might actually be taken? Who among the various groups recommend, re represented at this table actually has a strong interest in seeing some kind of action taken to counteract this? Okay, let's, let, well, out of respect, let's start with the Nigerian government. Well, thank you. Nobody has a greater interest uh, in seeing uh, for the welfare of the people of Kano than the Nigerian government. And let me point out that in the last uh, scenario, we heard from Boko Haram about how they want to bring justice and security to Kano. And this is evidence that they want to do anything but that, that all they want to do is slaughter. They want to impair security. They want to impair justice. And they want to impair economic development. We have decided today, uh, with the cooperation of the National Assembly, to extend the state of emergency to Kano State, and we have deployed the 143rd Battalion, newly trained by the United States, to Kano immediately to support that effort. We've also taken steps to completely reformulate our counterterrorism policy. We've built a new whole of government response to terrorism that includes both soft and hard tools. We have a CVE policy that will reform all the Majiri in the north and that will also work to promote a large counter-narrative campaign on all the radio stations in Kano. Okay. How, do, how does the local government feel about this? What is the response that you've got to this situation? Uh, the highly respected uh, uh, MEO of Kano has just called on uh, the people to wake up to arm themselves, to defend themselves against them. Uh, due to the inability uh, of uh, uh, Abuja uh, to, 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 to protect us. Now, uh, from time immemorial, the Emirates system in the north has a hierarchical structure of the emir, uh, the, the district heads, the village heads, the ward heads. And in that hierarchical order, uh, they had always had uh, some form of local policing, uh, the Dogari system, uh, which has also been affected uh, over the years, has become moribund in some emirates uh, due to lack of uh, uh, action, lack of funding, 
and so on. And they, they used to be extremely effective. Now, I think we are going to revive them uh, in line with the call of the Emir uh, for our people to stand up and defend ourselves. In doing that, we will work hand in hand with our state government, uh, who have also been calling on uh, Abuja uh, to allow them to establish the state police force, uh, like you have uh, uh, in, in, in other countries. So the, the, the joint effort of the Emirates system, uh, or the Emirates, together with the state government, uh, will be able to provide a strong policing at the local level. But in order to counter uh, those guys over there, uh, we have seen the success of uh, the vigilantes in Adamawa State, in my state. Uh, uh, up until two, three weeks ago, Boko Haram has swept across five local governments, which is one senatorial district of northern Adamawa. But with the mobilization of the vigilante groups, who have special charms uh, with their den guns, working hand in hand with the military. Uh, they were able to recapture some of those local governments and they are making a lot of progress, uh, clearing them from uh, northern Adamawa into Borno and hopefully uh, uh, out, out of that. So while you have the vigilante groups uh, uh, armed by the state, uh, 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 monitored by the state, uh, what they have given them uniforms in Adamawa, fatigue, military fatigue. They are also giving them photo IDs by the military. Are you proposing to do this in this scenario in, uh, in and around Kano? Yeah, because the security is number one as far as we are concerned. All these economic models will not work until we are able to secure our communities and we have heard what they have said. Thank you. Okay, well we've heard now what they, the governments have said they are going to do. Do those of you on the economic side or the NGO side think that these steps that are being taken are enough to encourage more investment? Well, we've been talking, our associations have been talking very closely with the state government. And we do believe that if uh, the state police are posted near our areas combined with the vigilantes, uh, we will be able to secure a number of our facilities and factories. Now, our concern is the outlying supply chain, uh, the provision of the goats and leather, uh, the provision of the uh, foodstuffs and so on that are going to be processed. Um, that will require some local policing, we believe, and the vigilantes may or may not be appropriate. That will have to be foreseen. But in any case, our ward development committee can, uh, can meet and decide uh, who we can recruit and how we can expand and diffuse their activities so that the various farms and locations of production can be protected. No, for us, the protection of our assets and our personnel are of the utmost importance, and at this time, we feel that that is impossible to do in northern Nigeria. We will focus our efforts on the south, and until we can be guaranteed safety and security of our, um, again, of our assets and our personnel, we will not be investing. Yeah. Sadly, since we've lost uh, 10 aid workers in the NGO community, we'll have to pull back our expat uh, presence in Kano and uh, uh, other insecure areas until uh, security is uh, reestablished. Uh, we'll be relying on local staff and local partners you know, to con try and continue to deliver humanitarian services and do economic livelihood programs. Yeah. Uh, the Business Association met and came out for the importance of the rule of law in, in face of these conflicts. Uh, the, the important uh, goal is to restart negotiations that were listed very clearly in the Chatham House report. And our goal is to eventually move to de-radicalization programs and, re and amnesty in the spirit in which President uh, Jonathan used to bring Tompolo into the the Niger Delta to guard the pipelines. And we'd also like to have a, an indictment of, of uh, 
former governor of uh, Bornu State, Sharif. Uh, the Nigerian NGOs um, feel that too much emphasis is being laid on protection of international business and call upon the state government to devote their resources to protecting the population, the general population. Because Boko Haram, if they uh, are frustrated in attacking some of the economic factories, will switch to civilian targets. So we need to make sure that the population centers are protected, civilians are protected, the international business can hire their own security. So in an absence of scarcity of resources, there should be definitely, together with the traditional mechanisms that were referred to before, measures to protect the population, and particularly schools and hospitals, et cetera. Well, here's a message that I'm getting from all of this, and so I'm going to turn to our colleagues from Boko Haram to help clarify things for me. But what, I, what, I, what I'm sort of getting from all of this is that the response, you know, that with the escalation of attacks, you know, you have the pullout of uh, the international NGOs. Uh, we have uh, the pullout of any interest at all from inter multinational corporations. You have the state and local governments saying the response needs to be a security response. Neither one of them has, you know, talked about any importance of economics. This seems to suggest that you're going to have a significant downturn in the economic conditions in this place, growing unemployment, and so forth. Is it, am I wrong in thinking that this creates a recruitment opportunity and the chance for a Boko Haram to grow? Because we seem to, I mean, you know, the way this scenario is going is we're talking about economic responses, and the first response of everybody is, well, it's not really the economics that matter. Um, but do they? Uh, several uh, things from Boko Haram. First, we point out uh, to everyone that the attacks which, are, which occurred, occurred in areas that we did not control. Our zones are peaceful and orderly. Secondly, the uh, factories attack were factories that declined an invitation to play, pay a reasonable, flat jihad tax to us. Thirdly, uh, we're, we've given, we're going to give an interview on which we will highlight the fact that the factory owners were close collaborators and, in fact, involved in corruption with the folks in Abuja and the central government. And finally, uh, in the zones in which we are controlled, not only is it orderly, but we've not only uh, and recruiting people through our signing bonuses from the last round, we've initiated trash pickup schemes and other things which create small-time employment, but certainly some opportunities for some people who otherwise had no services provided to them or no income generation. Okay, but now would you respond to my question? Well, since this area has, uh, over the last few years, declined uh, in economic opportunities, the closure of textiles and leather, in many respects, uh, anything we do actually adds to, uh, to productivity, cleaning up the streets, giving order to businesses, and in fact, represents an improvement in the experience of ordinary Nigerians than what they've had in the previous few years of so-called democracy. Right, but what happens is when you have that decline, the price you have to pay in order to recruit those people you know, actually goes down. All you have to do is give them a little bit. It actually makes you easier to recruit and it costs you less. Is that correct or am I? Uh, definitely, that's why we continue on our role. Uh, yeah, they continue on their role, yes. Everything we heard was nefarious doublespeak, and these people should be banished. Thank you. Uh, Kim, are you applying for assignment in another country? or? <laughs> so, yeah, I've always wanted to cover Nigeria. This is my chance. So, unfortunately, uh, although there were some, um, you know, lots of breaking news on the Twitter feed, uh, and I am in the region, it, this item did not make the front page, and it did not make the evening news on the BBC. So I have negotiated with my editors that because it is important to cover the story properly and in depth, I will go on an embed with Boko Haram for one week. I have received written guarantees that... I think um, Kim is saying she's about to leave. <laughs> <laughs> she's leaving the peace game. Um, I've received written guarantees that they will uh, guarantee my safety. My editors are thinking about it and discussing it with the insurance company. 
but I have agreed with my editors, uh, well, first of all, with Boko Haram, I've agreed that I can be with them for a week, that I will get one extensive interview with one of their local leaders. I will be accompanied by local journalists at all times. But with my editors, we've also heard what uh, the Northern Nigerian government has said, and we understand that there are starting to be murmurs of dissent against Boko Haram. We've heard about the vigilantes, and we're going to do a two-part interview to try to shed light as well on how the local population is starting to push back against uh, Boko Haram. It will be a two-part uh, uh, documentary that will air after I leave the region. And we are, looking, we are looking to partner with local media as well so that what we get in terms of access can also be translated into better understanding on the, for the local population about how some of the people in the community are starting to push back in the hope that it also empowers them to feel that this is not you know, the, the, the end-all be-all for them when it comes to Boko Haram. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, uh, the, see, you can't turn the situation around just on economics now because it's where it is at. Uh, but if there is seriousness about a local police force, the European Union has played a role in training police forces and prepared to do so. Uh, but you can't walk away from the economic situation. And I think more has to be done to provide loan, loan guarantees and protection for the business community uh, to keep working on the economic issues. Uh, but the security has to come with it. And, and is the international financial community going to back that up? Uh, because most of our programs and projects in the region are um, delivered by our implementing partners, those projects and programs will continue, such as the youth employment um, and local governance projects that started um, three or four months ago, which will continue for the next four or five years. So those remain uninterrupted. Um, those local businesses that were large enough to receive MEGA um, support will continue to receive that, but it will be difficult to um, grant additional guarantees given the security context today. But isn't it true that in a situation like this, more economic aid at a moment of crisis would actually be called for as opposed to less and seeing it wind down if you wanted to produce a positive result? Uh, yeah, I, let me just draw an uh, example from Afghanistan because I think it's quite similar. The Taliban launched a number of attacks against girls' schools in, 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 the, in the East. Um, and one would have expected to see a sort of snowball effect as the girls' schools closed. In fact, there was a lot of dialogue that took place, fostered in part by the government, between the local community and the Taliban, to the Taliban to understand that, in fact, this was something to keep these schools open was really important to the local community. Ultimately, the Tal Taliban did not want to piss off the local community. The community wanted to win them over. And in fact, most of these schools eventually got reopened. So one of the things we haven't talked about here is the dialogue that takes place between the community and Boko Haram, for example, in the case of somebody opening a factory or reopening a factory. Is it in the, really in the interest of the community to keep that factory going? Is the, the factory essentially predatory, or is it something that really is going to benefit the community? If it's going to benefit the community, can you get a dialogue going which makes it in the interest, even of Boko Haram, not, not to close this down? I mean, it's not but, an but, instant but, answer. But, but, but again, our goal here is not development. Our goal is counter-extremism. So we, I mean, while it is important to deal with development issues in a different context, what, our me what we want to focus on here are measures that will counteract them, which is a different kind of thinking. Raymond. Yes, um, we um, recognize that um, uh, uh, fall in economic, in economic development levels across the board could play into Boko Haram's hands. It might um, facilitate um, recruitment and um, cause community to be disaffected. But we also um, acknowledge the complexity of the value chain and the political economy in the north. So we don't want to just have money going into the north that will be siphoned off to the um, leaders of Boko Haram and their proxies in the business community. So what, so what do you want? What we, do, what, what we want is to have um, businesses um, feel, um, have a sense of trust 
and uh, take, um, take um, charge of the um, opportunity that um, presents itself. Um, and Specific. specifically, what we would do is we would, through the um, our governance program in the World Bank, we will be play a catalytic <laughs> role and get a donors meeting and get a partnership meeting together. So we'll have um, the business partners, the multi multinationals, and we would chart a way forward to ensure that not just economic assistance but investment flows are not disrupted because of the um, attacks. Dolores. Well, the Secretary General has before condemned uh, attacks of Boko Haram, but certainly does so in the most uncertain terms given the fact that aid workers have uh, been killed and we will have no recourse but to pull UN aid workers out of, the, of this area given the security situation, which unfortunately will only exacerbate the economic circumstances that uh, you know, are, are now fueling uh, the Boko Haram crisis. Um, Chad is, holds the presidency right now of the Security Council, so even though the UN must wait at all times uh, to respond to the will of its members, um, we can encourage the presidency to hold a special or call a special session of the Security Council to discuss the uh, deteriorating security situation in the area. Okay. Yes. So uh, we have a very clear view on extremism. We're very committed to fighting this. We have been doing this in other places. I think the main problem that we see is that these guys over here and these guys over here can't seem to get along. And I think Boko Haram has a great advantage in diversifying, in, in breaking, kind of, and utilizing these kind of structures between the local and the uh, state government. And uh, we're going to provide the customary. Um, six or seven figure number just to make sure that we are echoing our commitment here but we would like to see a much uh, stronger united front against Boko Haram behind which we can really rally and provide much much more substantial resources so you would offer resources to do economic development provided there was cooperation <coughs> from local governments in combating Boko Haram absolutely yes yeah we also see this as part of a much larger struggle and, for example, if you read what the uh, Kano businessman said, the reason why he went over to Boko Haram, he said, first of all, because they were better at anti-corruption. The second point he made, which has not been mentioned at all, is because of the purity of Islam that they're teaching, which is not economic. And we see this as a struggle throughout the region. And if you look at the religious leadership in our countries, from Egypt to Saudi Arabia and elsewhere, they have been vociferous in saying that these people are not good Muslims. And we believe that that's an essential element of any struggle against Boko Haram. Okay, I, we, we've got to you know, move this along. I want to turn to the expert panel to ask for some reactions in a, one second. But I want to go back to the neighboring countries, again, on whose doorstep this falls and who play a kind of a, a, a local judge role on what, on what we've just heard. But when I listen to what we've just heard, it's essentially the situation is ratcheted up. The economic conditions have deteriorated for a variety of factors associated with all they have to do is blow up a couple factories, the press covers it, the international multinationals pull out, uh, there's some aid workers killed, some of those programs get dialed back, the focus of the government becomes security as opposed to dealing with the economic crisis, recruitment grows, and we start. I start wondering, are we at the point where, since our goal is the best possible outcome, that we have to cordon off and contain this, that you have to cordon off and contain it because it's not getting fixed from within, and, and that you have to identify the places they haven't gone and try to deal with the right kind of economic and security conditions there. Or am I misinterpreting it? I think you, uh, you read our notes because uh, we have agreed that containment should be the priority. Uh, we have reached out to the United States and are willing to accept the training and equipment for our troops. Uh, we are willing to comply with the Leahy Amendment, uh, but we also want to have this done in a way that doesn't provoke Nigeria because they're the victims on the block. Uh, we also would like to reach out eventually to international NGOs to help us with the refugee crisis as people continue to flee Nigeria 
into uh, the neighboring countries. Okay, and, and that's important, and, and, and we, we, we should come to that in a second. Do those of you listening to this have a reaction? It's a, little, it's a little depressing that the reaction is not, let's fix this part of the world, but maybe the realistic answer is contain, isolate, that creates leverage with the government to clean up their act, and perhaps then you'll get there. It's, do you have a reaction beyond that? Or? Well, I think uh, what, I, what I take away from this is both in terms of the, the first move, but also now in terms of the second move, there don't seem to be many economic responses that are either workable or that would have an impact in this particular setting. Um, and so, yes, in that sense it is depressing, And but what I, I guess it does is sort of shift us forward to say, okay, if they're not economic responses, when we look at it this afternoon, are there other kinds of responses that would make more sense? We've had allusions to the need to um, engage local organizations and build local um, militias or whatever we want to call them, military um, assistant organizations. So I guess if, if what it suggests is that we shouldn't spend a lot of time talking about the economic parts of this, we ought to, we ought to be moving forward to the next part of the scenario. Please don't give up with George on our last move. You know, we've still got a half an hour to go. Johnny, you, you, you give it a little life here, but you know. <laughs> I, 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 I will try to. First, first of all, uh, economics and social opportunity do matter. Uh, one of the uh, drivers uh, of the uh, problems in the North are both political and economic uh, marginalization. Uh, the lack of, uh, of opportunity, uh, uh, great unemployment among uh, youth, uh, the uh, inability uh, to uh, move the economy uh, forward. And in fact, we've seen enor enormous uh, deindustrialization uh, across. If we're going to try to uh, uh, stop uh, the current role that, uh, uh, that Boko Haram is on, we also must include a, a comprehensive strategy uh, that deals with economic and social marginalization. I think the thing that has most impressed me uh, in the first uh, two moves uh, is the absence and lack of genuine creativity uh, on the part of the business community, uh, on the part of the uh, international uh, financial uh, community uh, and on the part uh, of the uh, NGO NGOs to find ways uh, to reach out and collaborate with willing partners uh, and to try to build up progressively uh, uh, counter uh, uh, narratives uh, that in real terms uh, to what Boko Haram is putting uh, on the, uh, in place. Uh, the reason they're able to recruit uh, is that Boko Haram also gives them both uh, political uh, and psychological status, but also uh, money in their pockets. And I uh, would challenge uh, those uh, who are in the international community, if they're at the IFES, uh, those who are in the NGO community, and those who are in the business sector to help find a way to create jobs, create uh, opportunities, and to provide at least some uh, zones or, or oases uh, of economic promise that no longer exist. This is a really, really important point, because we can give up. You know, we can say, okay, the economics isn't going to matter, um, and just sort of coast through the next thing. Or we can do what the idea of the peace game is to do which is to try and be creative. I'm not saying that everybody here hasn't been exactly realistic in what is likely to happen. But what we want to do now is go and push it a step and say, how creative can you be within the realm of possibility? What's a possibility that somebody isn't considering that could get the multi multilateral, multinational corporations in there? What's a possibility that people, well, we're not going to, we're going to get to the next move and then you can answer it. But, but what's the possibility that would get the IFIs in there, or get international governments involved, get local businesses to do something? Please, let's make the focus. We only have a half hour left in this. Let's make the focus of the last move, creativity, 
coming up with new ideas, not being constrained simply by what has happened in the past, but by thinking about what might be possible in the future. The next move, the final move is, a Nigerian bank is accused of financing Boko Haram and laundering funds. The UN calls for an international response. Reports emerged today that the Nigerian capital, in the Nigerian capital, that a major bank used by international businesses, development organizations, governments, been laundering Boko Haram funds and helping finance the group. A UN spokesperson called on Nigeria and the countries around the world to respond to the recent news. So we want to talk about how do you restrict the flow of funds to Boko Haram as well as dealing with these other economic issues. It's the third, it's a, it's, it's a new piece thrown into the, to the puzzle, okay? I'm going to have to really limit this break to just five minutes. It's right now a quarter of, so at 10 of, we're going to move into the next move. But please, creativity, I'm going to only turn to people who have new ideas here. Okay, thank you. <coughs>
No, no, no. I wasn't. Oh, I wasn't okay. going to switch up. No, no, no. Oh. All right. L Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin in two minutes. So please finish up and head back to your seats. Would everybody please take their seats? So, um, we're getting to an important point in any scenario exercise, and that's the point where everybody realizes the limitations of the scenario. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge that this is a point you get into in any scenario exercise. Uh, and there are several ways that one encounters this. Uh, for example, we've talked a lot about security here, and it would make perfect sense to have an entire scenario focused on the security issues. But we had a limited amount of time, and we thought we'd focus on a couple of issues. And since the focus is, you know, peace game, uh, that we thought we would focus on the issues where one could counter extremism without military action, even though we know that military action is extremely important, or counterinsurgency is really important. And so that's one area, and we have to sort of recognize that and work within the context of it. As we said at the dinner last night, there are lots of drivers of extremism. We're only going to talk about a couple of them here today. Um, the second is that within the confines of the scenario, there is a kind of a desire to respond to the situation of the scenario. But if there is no best possible outcome, or if there is no good outcome, then the best possible outcome might be longer term um, progress, as opposed to shorter term progress. You were making this point to me, Chris. Perhaps you could make it in yeah, 60 I, seconds. I, I would just like to make the point to everyone that, to me, the issue between being realistic and being creative, if we were realistic over the last so many years, we wouldn't have been making the mistakes that we've been making. And so I came originally thinking <laughs> military force, yes. I did the research that you all sent. I said, no, that's not going to be it. And then I thought, well, where I'm coming now because I want to be realistic is our problem is with this government. And we have got to collectively all figure out how we get a change in this government because most of the creative things we want to do won't happen unless we get buy-off from the government. That's one perspective. But you know, you might, you might want to add your perspective too, Patrick. Because No, no, I think it's an important perspective, but... Right. What I was able to do in that break there was fly in Jimmy Carter and, and Bill Clinton to broker a meeting between the locals and the central government. Um, and, and the AU came in and helped monitor that. They may have some, some, some points on the outcome of that, of that meeting. But I also um, managed to get approval from Congress to reprogram $50 million to, st to start a pot to create a, a technical education and jobs program. We're going to open training academies in the north. The Nigerian government agreed to match that, uh, at least match that. I got uh, agreement from the multinational companies that they would employ these, uh, uh, these youth that we were going to recruit and train. 
um, there in the north. So we're making progress. I think there's some more people on the fence. How many, how many fence. people can you train with 50? Um, I, you know, we can train if it, it, at a monthly training. You know, if it's a month, sort of month or two month long, we can train 500 kids a month. That's our initial goal. Well, indeed, we welcome this uh, unusual offer of cooperation from the United States. <laughs> <clears throat> but yes, during the... What's so unusual about it? They offered to train your troops. But, well, that's another story, yeah, I guess. Too many yeah. conditions. <laughs> but no, I'm very, I'm delighted, indeed, to announce the Good Luck Plan. We uh, had a very successful meeting with the Northern Governors <laughs> Association and with uh, local uh, Nigerian business interests and have come up with a... Uh, a infrastructure and job creation program across northern Nigeria that we will fund in part using our infrastructure funds uh, from the fuel subsidy program that's been relaxed and we will look to gradually reduce the fuel subsidies uh, in future to create uh, to free up further funds and the northern governors have agreed to support us politically with this important development for the country we welcome the U.S. offer of $50 million to create a youth training program. It's going to be focused on practical skills, and we have, a, we have ways to put those people to work for the benefit of northern Nigeria right away. Like sort of getting out the vote for the February election? Yeah. <laughs> well, we'd, like to just, we'd also like to note that while we respect uh, the U.S.'s wishes of dealing with a constitutional monarchy or di military dictatorship, we are a democracy, um, and we have to work with those constraints uh, that we have. Um, and we do have an election coming up. Um, so and the other thing we wanted to mention is that, you know, part of this is that, as our national security advisor just noted, we're action oriented, right? We want to get this done. And so we, we're looking really to sort of see what it is. And we don't want to talk about doing things. We want to see what is it that our international partners, because this case behind us, in front of us, clearly shows that we need designations. This goes beyond our mandate. I mean, we need a much larger, international community has to shut down the banks, that are funding this from the outside. We have to do designations on families where the money's coming from. We need support, and we can't do this alone. What can we do to shut down the banks? What can we do, Jim, to put pressure on the funding for Boko Haram? Lean, 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 lean forward and, yeah. It's one uh, situation if you've got a uh, banking a bank that is plugged into the international community. We have uh, means that we've uh, demonstrated many times, at least the United States and the international community, the UN, various tools uh, to do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, if it's a bank that is under the control of the uh, Nigerian government and doesn't have an international uh, uh, posture, uh, you're uh, left at the uh, devices of the uh, Nigerian government to do whatever you right. can. But at least in the case of this scenario here, this bank is plugged into the international community. Mm -hmm. And so one does have the ability to put some pressure on the funding for Boko Haram. I mean, to the extent that it is plugged into the international community, again, uh, as you know, the Treasury Department is capable of essentially shutting down not only its activities, <coughs> but any other bank in the world that would deal with it. And that essentially closes down. Uh, uh, typically, uh, it puts it out of business as an international player, and most banks don't want to see that happen, so they cut whatever ties they have with whatever group. It's actually one of the most effective things that uh, we've talked about today, I think. Done. Because you said that. No. No, because, no. <laughs> because you asked, you asked the right question. Okay, okay, good. Johnny. Let me just uh, add uh, that the uh, U.S. government, in two different measures, uh, has placed individuals as well uh, as Boko Haram uh, on the foreign uh, terrorist uh, organization list. Uh, their presence uh, on that list uh, gives uh, the U.S. Uh, government uh, the legal uh, leverage uh, to undertake both uh, political and economic uh, sanctions uh, against those individuals and those uh, institutions that are supporting them. And will the EU go along with this? You're the EU, Prince. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah uh, we've done that in the past on, on other situations of shutting down uh, financing of, uh, of those uh, uh, banks and bank <coughs> operations and putting sanctions into place. And there are 
international structures for doing that. So the African Union was referenced earlier. You've been quiet in the previous two moves. So what are you doing here? The first, I want to uh, take exception. Um, uh, I think that in this case, it's obvious that the international community is as guilty, uh, uh, perhaps, as the Nigerian government in, in regulating this bank. Uh, the donors, uh, the, the uh, international business, they're all involved in this bank and, and thus supporting in some way or fashion the, uh, uh, the ability of Boko Haram to find funding. I think it needs to be reviewed across the uh, spectrum uh, of actors who are reinforcing the ability of Boko Haram to operate. The African Union is monitoring the situation very, very closely and <coughs> welcomes the attention of the international community in all of these areas. That was For, very realistic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we welcome the U.S. government's um, intervention and think that not only an envoy from the U.S. government, but a distinguished African elder would facilitate a more um, serious and earnest dialogue among the parties. Oh God. I mean, great. Um, so we have the finance minister of Boko Haram about to speak, so. Okay. So when we first, these reports first emerged, we thought it was an attempt um, by the Nigerian government to impugn our credentials as a force for, against corruption um, in Nigeria. But we did launch our own internal investigation um, of these allegations that we were using an un-Islamic banking system to launder funds. Um, and what we did find an element within our organization um, who had been engaging in these un-Islamic practices. And shortly we will be posting um, video of the trial and execution of that number. Um, and we uh, are restating our commitment to Islamic banking practices and our commitment against corruption. Uh, in Nigeria. Well, let me ask you a question in terms of your own internal meetings, okay? This is not your public statements, which are tedious and as bad as theirs. <laughs> but um, but it's, in terms of internally, shutting down the banking, getting these guys putting sanctions on some of these flows of international funds, coming up with, I don't know, $100 million for training and some other programs in this area, does it squeeze you at all, really? I mean, are you, in private meetings, I'm not talking about your public stance, how does this affect your operations? Go ahead. It doesn't really affect them because fundamentally we're not interested in economic development. We're interested in the creation of God's kingdom on earth through justice for the poor by means of the enforcement of Sharia law. That's what we're interested in. We don't care about what the international banking system does. Okay, well this is you know, clearly the ideological department of the Boko Haram. <laughs> but, you know, Peter, you're in charge of recruitment. And, you know, you have to face recruitment, and you're in charge of operations, and you've got to look at what's in the bank account. How, do, how does this affect you guys? Well, it, it begins to affect us. So we have to, we've taken measures, uh, which we're not free to disclose, but we've taken measures Well, to you can tell us. We're friends. <laughs> Well, I, I, I think maybe the neighboring countries might want to weigh in. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> well, we, um, we note, of course, the um, uh, desire to impose sanctions on this bank, but uh, we would want to understand very clearly if that bank has branches in any of our countries, if it has shareholders in any of our countries, and we would certainly insist on sanctions being imposed in a targeted manner so that it does not negatively affect economic growth in our country. And then a second point I'd just like to note, um, we've uh, noticed with a great deal of interest uh, because of the deteriorating security situation that international aid agencies, organizations, NGOs, and multinational corporations are now preparing to leave northern Nigeria. We would like to invite them to consider relocating in any of our three countries, and we would be happy to offer them a very warm welcome. Thanks. Um, okay, we've, we've got literally just five, six minutes here, so I'm going to go around the room, and I'm going to ask you for 30 to 60 seconds, but what I'd really like you to focus, I mean, I, I, no more publicity statements, um, you know, communiques that you're issuing. If, if you've got something concrete that you think of as a fairly creative idea that can actually help address the situation, produce the best possible outcome, we want to hear it. Princeton? Look, 
uh, I've been talking to the corporate council and other business communities. There's a lot of things you can do economically in the short term, and they, uh, you can put up a power plant in three months. You could put up power plants. You've got a railroad that goes Lagos to Kano. You could uh, jumpstart a lot of the industries. You could start public works projects. EU could contribute to that as well as other donors. So jumpstarting some of the economic activity is not a long-term proposition. There are long-term things to do, but the idea that you can't do anything significant in the short term is not true. And, the, and power is so vital to the industrial refinancing of uh, reindustrialization. That plus other things with the business community could begin to have a not only an impact but provide some hope in the community that things are going to come back. Okay, that's that's very that's very uh, helpful. Does Power Africa want to send any of its funds to this, since it's got Absolutely. all these billions of dollars committed? But it, yes, okay, Power Africa. Okay, very briefly, we're really going for constructive right. solutions. Right. Actually, the, the constructive solution, the, the point, reason I point to the neighboring countries is the fact is that it's, if you're going to do economic development or anything in northeastern Nigeria, it makes a lot more sense to go through the neighboring countries than to run through Abuja. And that's the reason we had, our, we had moved our banking operation to those branches uh, in, uh, in uh, the neighboring countries, and that's why the neighboring countries are hectoring for sanctions on Nigeria. See, now that was half constructive. Half of that was very constructive. <laughs> yes, go on, go on, Liam. Um, but, but quickly, we've got to get around the whole table here. Very, very quickly. Um, operations are going to get expensive if we keep kind of expanding and expanding because the networks that are able to create the Lean safe forward a little more, sorry, sorry. the networks that are, would be able to create safe quarters to have the types of attacks in places that are outside of our base of operations requires a lot of money to grease the skids and we we do we will feel a financial squeeze if we don't keep up our profits as well and so okay we, we will feel That's it That's very helpful all right go on Kate uh, so as members of the Financial Accountability and uh, Corporate Transparency Coalition, uh, we'd like to remind everyone that we need laws that to require public disclosure of all business entities, banks, corporations, charities, trust foundations, not just in Nigeria, not just in the West, in the neighboring countries as well, so we can continue to put the squeeze on Boko Haram financially. Okay. That's a s constructive step. Yeah, yeah. The businessmen, uh, business owners in uh, northern Nigeria wish to point out that this uh, financial problem really doesn't affect the northern business community because they have been marginalized from the banking system when it was restructured about 10 years ago. Most of the banks are not controlled by northern Nigerians. The, okay. the really important uh, innovation is to provide Sharia compliant credit linked to microcredit systems. We all have to remember that the Green Bank was invented by a Bangladeshi Muslim. Okay. Yeah, very quickly. Well, the business community needs to speak because this is an economic issue. Uh, we strongly endorse and welcome this uh, $50 million program from the U.S. government to do youth training. We will be happy as a northern business community to absorb the trainees. In addition, we look forward to the Nigerian government's program to do a works project in infrastructure to kickstart, as Princeton said, the uh, economic activity of the area. Again, we would be happy to provide technical support to any organization that would like to also, through the Sure P, which is a few subsidy program, which is a very large fund in the, at the federal level, uh, to start a, businesses and enterprises in the north and to provide credit for those businesses. Okay, the media will add nothing of value. No, no, the, the media will always speak because we own the, me the megaphone. Uh, well, speak for 30 <laughs> seconds, you understand. <laughs> now, um, speaking on, from the home office and from the Wall Street Journal, we, I mean, as a story, we just check it out. Uh, we appreciate Kim's enthusiasm. Um, but there is, we think, something deeper here. It's also prize season, and I think there's a possibly a really um, good investigative story yeah, on terror financing, and you got to dig in Nigeria, but also dig in the U.S. Uh, with uh, Treasury uh, to see what they know, and uh, it has to sort of speak to a bigger piece of how do you uh, stop money from flowing to these groups. Okay. 
Anybody got anything constructive here? That's so unlikely. <laughs> Look, if this really matters, and I'm not just talking about rhetoric and on paper, on social media, and people holding up signs, with all due respect to the First Lady, I would say that you have to have a coalition of governments against Boko Haram. You get, some, you get people to contribute money, resources. There has to be a coalition, just like we have against Daesh and ISIL. That's how you get movement on this. Okay. Michelle. Be being members of the, of the coalition against ISIL, are you comparing yourself to the Assad regime in this scenario? Because the main <laughs> problem that we have with, with forming a coalition in Nigeria is lack of leadership of the government. There are great ideas from the European Union that we echo, and we could totally come in and equal uh, those funds that are committed. $50 million, $50 million from the U.S. is also great. But again, if a Nigerian government and the local governments in the north cannot work together, then all of this money and all of these commitments and all of this assistance that can come in very quickly, actually, I believe, is not really going to materialize. So really, the ball is in your court. Mich I, I Michelle, what is the UAE prepared to do? What is the UAE prepared to do? You're Who's speaking to me, the media. The media. What is the UAE prepared to do? The UAE is prepared to come in as an economic partner of the European Union proposal, which we find is very constructive. Okay. I, I, by the way, I think one, you know, there are several things bubbling up here that can actually turn into something, but I think one of the things that might be extrapolated from Peter's point is some of the economic development should go into northern Nigeria. Some of the economic development should go into the neighboring countries to ensure that you don't have the spread of extremism out of this region of northern Nigeria. And so some of it's prophylactic, some of it's dealing with the immediate crisis. Very, very briefly, we're running out of time. Yes, uh, the government of uh, the state of Kano never believes anything in punch, uh, particularly if it's reported from uh, Abuja, point one. Point two, the Boko Haram people have already blown up the bank in question to show that they don't use that banking system. Now we've cleared the decks. We want the Marshall Plan that has been mentioned by distinguished American diplomats. We want the consulate. There's never a Marshall Plan. In, there will never be another one. Forget about that. To, we need a consulate there to facilitate this, and then we'll, of course, need the security to go along with it. Boko Haram is not on a roll. We're going to clean house in Abuja after February 14th. <laughs> okay, Raymond. Yeah, just quick specific speaking to the move. I uh, want to continue the um, delivery of economic assistance. Firstly, um, mobile banking to ensure that the economic operators could still receive their money even though um, the bank that they um, did business through might go down. Secondly, um, in enhanced um, banking supervision to prevent contagion and to limit the, um, the, the uh, fallout because we want to ensure that the international businesses, international NGOs could still bring their money in and um, support investment in the north. <coughs> Last brief word, Nick. Yeah, I just actually want to come back to the summary that was made of the last session. I, I just want to say I, ex I disagree very strongly with the summary that was made that economic development is not, is, is not important, it's not going to work. Uh, okay, what, yeah, no, but I'm sort of saying nothing specific has come up. I mean, I think there are lots of specific things that have come up. I mean, I think from, the, from this side, we've also talked about policy-based operations and, and the like, uh, education, health, uh, uh, social protection, community development, all of these things can be done. But the, the point I would like to leave you with is there are no silver bullets. I mean, there have been lots of good minds working in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. It is a long grind, and you've got to be prepared for the long grind. And thinking that there are sort of instant things which are going to magically transform a state and magically knock over uh, Boko Haram is not going to happen. You've got to think of this as a long-term <coughs> commitment. Okay. I, I, I don't think anybody can disagree with that. We've come to the end of this particular session. I do think that in this last round, there, there, there have been some specific things which are not, um, you know, magic bullets, but may actually advance us toward the goal of improving the situation to a degree. Whether that is identifying sources of financing, tracking them, trying to cut them off, better banking regulation, international cooperation to do that, that's one area. If it's programs, even small training programs where the United States can get together and try to do something with the local government, 
that is something that could be constructive in this regard. I think a very important point is that if our objective is to contain extremism, it's harder to make economic grounds gains in a place where the flames are licking at every industry. It's easier to use economics as a tool in places that have yet to have crossed the line. And so in the neighboring states, in supporting development, supporting job creation in places, to keep things from spreading there also seems to be extremely um, constructive. We don't disconnect it from security because we know that that's got to be involved in this. We also don't disconnect it from long-term development issues because ultimately, unless you educate women, unless you deal with public health, unless you deal with public education issues, unless you deal with infrastructure issues, you can't actually have sustained organic economic growth. If you don't have that, you can't improve the condition. And remember, we're talking about a country which, despite its enormous gains in wealth, has roughly two-thirds of the people living in poverty. And so you, ha you have to address that as a core issue. I think there are other things that we could have talked about a little bit more, things the international community could do to be a little bit tougher on governments that practice corruption, um, that governments that you know, may be exposed to uh, constraints on their behavior as a result of their con corruption. Um, and I think some of the individual programs, whether it's small government, uh, small local businesses saying that they're going to absorb some of these workers, um, these are also c constructive. There is no way we come out of a scenario like this with um, the ultimate list. Uh, there is no way we come out of it with, you know, revelations that um, haven't you know, ever been expressed before. But by trying, as I think we've done quite successfully, to create the realistic dynamic here, we get a sense of where we might be able to make a little bit of progress, what might be a little bit more productive, what might be possible, what might not be possible. Um, and we get a little bit of a sense of how different parties will take advantage of changes in the dynamic. And that's, you know, that's the purpose. There's, there is no you know, last word on this, the idea of peace game is ongoing series of conversations. The next component of the conversation is going to begin in about 30 minutes when we're going to get together and we're going to talk about political scenarios because there is an election coming up. There's an election uh, in February, in fact. Um, and that's extremely important to the issues that we've talked about today in terms of governance, the functioning of this government, how that might interplay with Boko Haram in the north, uh, how that might interplay with the security issues. And if we take the economic of the morning and we take the political of the afternoon, we'll have some better insights. That's all that we can hope for, some better insights that will help lead us in the direction of some better outcomes. But as, I, you know, as my mother would always tell me, the secret to good thinking is eating enough. Um, and so th th yes, applause for my mother. Um, uh, and so what, what, I, what I'd like to suggest that we do is take 30 minutes. You'll hear those little chimes at the end. We'll come back in. We'll have a discussion framing the political discussion. Um, but because we're in the U.S. Institute of Peace, I do want to leave the last word of the morning session to George. Uh, no, I think you've summed it up. Uh, my, my, in earlier remark was intended in part to be a challenge because what I wasn't hearing was precisely what we were able to get to in this final part, which is some specific ideas about things that could be done. And I, I believe, going back to Johnny's remark, that one, one of the things that these exercises do is they challenge us to get outside of our normal assumptions about the kinds of things we can and can't do. And, and particularly, to focus us on what we can do as opposed to what we can't do. And that, uh, that, I think that final part of this did, did in fact get us to where um, I, I hope we will continue to be as we move forward until the afternoon. So thank you. Th thank you. And so go eat. <laughs> go, go eat.